work session of the Texas County City Council. Uh, not a new question, but it's in federal. So I'd like to call to order the uh, this work session of the Ketchikan City Council. Uh, Madam Clerk, can you please call the roll? Matani. Yes. Bradbury. Here. Kissler. Here. Flora. Here. Gas. Here. Zini. Here. Gage. Here. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. The Ketchikan City Council would like to respectfully acknowledge the traditional first people of this land in Ketchikan, the Tongass Tlingit people. Uh, we have no communications and we have no persons to be heard. So we're going to go right into new business. We're going to first have an introduction by the Ketchikan Visitors Bureau and then some presentations by some local cruise industry members. After each person speaks, there will be some time for the council to uh, ask their questions and comments. So with that, uh, I guess we're into the introduction by the Ketchikan Visitors Bureau. Thank you, Patty. Good evening, council members, and thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, I'm glad we were able to make get this work session um, organized. We started discussing this back in uh, December, I believe, during budget hearings, and um, it took a little bit of shuffling, but city manager was very persistent, and she got us all scheduled in at the same time. Um, I'm going to keep my comments really brief because really, the point of tonight is to provide information to the council with regard to what is actually already happening in the cruise industry in Ketchikan um, and giving you some information that will be helpful, I think, for you as you continue your discussion about how you're going to move forward in managing and marketing the port. So um, I will just have a little bit of, of a presentation down towards the end of the evening, but really, um, it's all about these folks who have uh, taken time to come tonight and share their experiences, and, and I hope it's worthwhile for all of you. So with that, I will thank you. Thank you. Our first speaker tonight will be Rene Limoges-Reeve, Vice President of Government and Community Relations, Cruise Lines International, Alaska. Good evening. Can you all hear me? We can, Renee. Okay, wonderful. Um, thank you, Vice Mayor Flora um, and City Council members. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you this evening. Um, as you said, my name is Renee Limoges Reeve, and I'm Vice President of Government and Community Relations for Cruise Lines International Association, Alaska. CLIA Alaska is part of a global network. We in Alaska represent 17 member cruise lines, and we bring about 99 percent of all cruise passengers to Alaska. Our members represent ships with capacities from 175 passengers to 4,600. Um, while Alaska only represents 5% of the global cruise market, we continue to be a very attractive destination for travelers and a bucket list trip for people around the world. And we don't have to tell you that. You see a number of them every year um, getting off the ships, thrilled to see what Alaska has to offer and thrilled to be in Ketchikan. Alaska cruises are still in high demand, and because of that, you've seen more ships being added to the market, especially in the years prior to the pandemic. So when cruise companies first decide to deploy a ship or add more ships to a region, they determine what a viable itinerary looks like, and they analyze the availability of port destinations. Lines will consider whether or not they feel that market can absorb another 40 to 50,000 guests, where that ship should come from or would come from, how long to, to get a new ship into the market, how it would impact current bookings, if the extra capacity were lowered or, or lowered or raised pricing, and what they feel their competitors might do. Is there dock space available? Is there enough shore X capacity for guests to have fun? And a myriad of other commercial factors. A typical seven-day Alaska itinerary includes three ports and a day of glacier viewing. All three ports plus the port of embarkation have to have availability. So it's not just about one port community visiting Ketchikan or any other port. 
must also fit in with a larger itinerary. And I know Rick um, with Claw will speak to you next about that and the complexities and what goes into the jigsaw puzzle of putting together a schedule. But there's a checklist that must be met to make the ecosystem of cruise ship itineraries work. A lot of moving parts and pieces have to be managed and there has to be collaboration among the cruise lines, communities, suppliers, ship agents, and tour operators. One of the biggest aspects of my job and my role at CLIA uh, and the role of CLIA Alaska is to represent the cruise industry to the port communities we visit. But in doing so, it's not just about relaying the industry's needs to the communities, but also the community's thoughts and perspectives to the industry. We can't coexist. We have to coexist. We can't exist without each other. CLIA Alaska wants to ensure collaborative relationships in the port communities we visit, and that's no different in Ketchikan. In addition to communicating with your local officials like Lacey and Brad, we're in touch with Patty at the Visitors Bureau, business leaders, tour operators, and others in Ketchikan on a regular basis. And we think that that's a huge part of our job. Um, this past year, we've we started holding pre and well post and what will now be pre season meetings with the port communities in an effort to recap the season, level set, and share expectations going into the season. We were lucky enough to have that meeting with Lacey and Brad and Vice Mayor Flora in December, I believe, early December. And we'll be in Ketchikan in person in April to do that again. It's an opportunity to information share and address concerns that communities might have. Um, we're also working with member lines right now to develop a 10-year outlook that will be shared with city manager in an effort to give Ketchikan a sense of what we anticipate the needs of the cruise industry to be in the coming years what size ships our member lines will be bringing, how the community can be prepared. Um, tourism best management practices is another way for the cruise industry, businesses, citizens, and local governments to address issues brought about by the influx of cruise passengers in Alaskan communities. The success of the 25 year program in Juneau has led six other Alaskan communities, including Ketchikan, to implement similar programs to ensure communication and collaboration lead the way in, in our industry. At the end of the day, if you determine you wanna hire a tourism manager, the best thing I'd like to leave you with is to hire someone who understands all the players and wants to work with all the different stakeholders. And hire someone who wants to work with the industry. An adversarial relationship will not benefit any of us. I'd liken it to hiring a police chief. We all have opinions about crime, but your police chief lives and breathes those issues. The person you should hire should know the issues, know all the different players from independent tour operators to real, retailers and yes, cruise line executives, because at the end of the day, a tourism director can't market Ketchikan to the world or even very effectively to cruise lines because that's not really how it works, but they can liaise between the city council and your community and the tourism industry that's vital to Ketchikan in our state. And that's what we would like to see if you move forward in that. So thank you for your, for your time tonight and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, any, any questions for Misery? I have one. Um, is there any news out of Canada as far as where they're at for this upcoming season? So I'll tell you, we continue those discussions. Um, our, our counterpart in, in Canada is very, very involved and we've seen movement. We know that Canada has been waiting a little bit to see what the CDC was going to do and we're hoping that um, what happened last week with the CDC and our member lines um, adopting the voluntary program will help to give them some more reassurance. Um, you know, Ketchikan, Juno, Skagway were very complimentary at the end of last season. We were able to sail to your communities um, safely with little to no impact on your, on your healthcare systems. Um, and I would anticipate that we would look to do the same this year with a very similar structure. Um, but we're still waiting on Canada. The long and the short of it is we're still waiting. Okay, thank you very much. Our next, speak, our next speaker is, oh, I'm sorry. I have a question. Mr. Bertoni. Thank you for being with us today. You said earlier in your presentation, cruise lines will be bringing in ships up to 4,600 passengers. Aren't there bigger ships scheduled to come called Southeast Alaska ports? And are, are there going to be some this year or how are we handling that? What, what I was saying earlier in the presentation is that our member lines represent ships of up to 4,600 people. To be honest with you, Rick's probably the better person to be able to tell you what we have scheduled um, right now for your community. Thank you. Absolutely. Any other, any other questions? 
Okay, thank you very much. Our next speaker is Rick Erickson, Vice President Operations, Cruise Line Agencies of Alaska. Uh, good evening, City Council, uh, Vice Mayor Flora. Uh, first and foremost, uh, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank you for having me to speak with you tonight. My name is Rick Erickson. Uh, I work uh, with Cruise Line Agencies of Alaska here locally in Ketchikan and uh, oversee all of Alaska individual ports on, uh, on Cruise Line's behalf, uh, which includes all of Southeast as well as Anchorage. Uh, and uh, Seward Whittier areas. Tonight I'm here to speak to you uh, uh, to a couple of your agenda items tonight. Actually there's four of them, one of which will be uh, itinerary planning and how ports are linked together for in planning and development. The other one is, is how we work with the new and interested cruise lines wanting to come into the market. And three, how our annual dock assignments determine and who's involved in those decisions. And last but not least is what does a ship agent do? Um, that could be a while if you want me to explain all of what a ship agent will do, but I will not do that in this case. And bear with me on the slide thing here, if you would, please. So when we, uh, in regards to itinerary planning, I think it's important to note that when we plan uh, for voyages in Alaska, more importantly, we just, we, when in scheduling ships, we're not scheduling just for Ketchikan alone. Um, we plan region-wide through southeast and up into southwest Alaska, which includes Whittier and Seward. Cruise line scheduling in Alaska is based on historic priority. Um, there are a number of things that are considered uh, when taking historic priority into consideration in scheduling ships, not only in Ketchikan, but throughout other ports throughout southeast Alaska, one of which is the number of years the cruise line has been operating in Alaska. Uh, to that point, I can tell you that each port is different. For example, Juno's historic priority may be different than Skagway's. Skagway's may be different than in, uh, Ketchikan's. And again, historic priority is based on the, uh, the number of years each of the member lines have been calling into the state of Alaska. That's how it's determined. Another important factor is the number of years operating in a particular port. Um, again, each port is different. Skagway may be different than Juno. Juno may be different in Ketchikan. It all depends on how long uh, an, an individual, individual cruise line has been calling in that port. And then also we get down into the traditional day of the week in which a cruise line and, and their vessel has been calling for, in, in a particular port. Uh, for Ketchikan, an example would be um, a celebrity on a Sunday having a particular ship in Ketchikan on Sunday, historically every Sunday. Uh, we take that into consideration uh, comparatively to that. If someone else wanted to move in on that day, uh, celebrity would have the, uh, a priority on that typical day of the week. Typically, cruise lines uh, submit their schedules to us two years in advance. Uh, here now, I'm beginning to receive 24 schedules. So we're looking roughly about two years out. Um, once the majority of the schedules we receive from all the operators looking at wanting to uh, operate in Alaska, uh, we, put, uh, we enter them into the schedule, of which at that point in time, we then begin identifying conflicts, not only in the port of Ketchikan, but other ports throughout Southeast Alaska. This slide here is, is <coughs> kind of shows you what we have available as it relates to bursts as well as anchorages uh, throughout Southeast. And this is, uh, plays a major factor when we're scheduling ships in Alaska and one in knowing how many bursts and or anchorages are available as to, to place ships in each of the respective ports. So as you can see, Juno has a four bursts, one anchorage. Uh, Ketchikan now having six bursts in one anchorage. Uh, this is certainly given Ketchikan an opportunity, as we all know, that some bursts has have opened up for us based on the fact that, um, in, in speaking in general, downtown Ketchikan with uh, the two new Ward Cove bursts. And then uh, there's a list of other uh, um, uh, ports that have the number of ships that they can accommodate each and given day. I think it's important to note 
here, if you were to look at Seattle and Vancouver, each of them have three, three berths. And that's an important key in scheduling cruise ships into Alaska because historically, Friday, Saturday, Sunday are to capacity in both Vancouver and Seattle, uh, meaning that in the middle of the week we find in Ketchikan, Juneau, Skagway, uh, our, our to capacity here. Once uh, conflicts are identified, we then uh, look at trying to figure out how we're going to solve those conflicts. Um, there are a few things that we take into consideration. I've listed a few of them here. Uh, there's certainly more, but um, bullet point number one, in the event of a birthing request is received from one or more cruise line for a particular day of the week, prior to will be given to that cruise line that has historically called that day of the week. Okay, an example of that would be, let's take Thursdays where we have uh, two Holland America ships and two Princess ships in port that given day. If another member line, for example, RCI looked at wanting to place a ship in Ketchikan on Thursday, uh, certainly they could, but it would either be at Ward Cove or at Anchor. So that's an example of historically where Princess and Holland have had two ships here on Thursday. Uh, no one else would, you know, we would look at filling either the Anchorage or Ward Cove on that day. Another bullet point that's taken into consideration is the birthing seniority rights for a specific day. It belongs to the cruise line, not necessarily the ship. So an example of that would be um, on Sundays, if we have the solstice calling uh, catch again on Sundays, um, and they elected to replace the solstice with another celebrity ship, celebrity would still have priority on that day on that Sunday. If more than one cruise line is requesting the same day of the week, of which neither cruise line has, has historically called on that day, priority would be given to the cruise line that with historic priority. An example of that would be, for example, if you had Princess and Hall in America, which typically have never, or say for example, typically haven't called on Saturday, each of them wanted to call catch again on a Saturday, priority would be given to Hall in America on that day, just based on the fact that historically they've called Alaska, more importantly, Ketchikan, longer than Princess. And then the last but not least priority is given to a cruise line that calls a port on a specific day of the week on a weekly or bi-weekly basis over the vessel that would call here randomly. And an example of that would be if you have a San Francisco ship sailing out of Seattle on a 10-day itinerary, they're not going to fall on the same day of the week as it would be a Vancouver and or Seattle ship would fall you know, on a weekly basis. So priority would be given to that vessel that is called here on a weekly basis. The next four slides are going to give you a general idea of what uh, itineraries are offered through, South, or through Alaska. The, the typical ones that we see, typically we see Vancouver, Vancouver's, which are seven-day itinerary round trips. Uh, these itineraries may vary. They may call Ketchikan, Juneau, uh, Skagway, Tracy Arm back down to Vancouver, or they may call first Juneau, Skagway, Glacier Bay, then Ketchikan. It all varies. And all this is part of the puzzle that we put together in port availability as it relates to historic priority, not only in Ketchikan, but each of the respective ports throughout Southeast. Another uh, common itinerary that you'll see is Seattle Round Trips. Uh, there again, um, typically seven day. However, we are now seeing more cruise lines going to six, seven, and eight day itineraries based on the fact that that'll get them on an off day in which another port would be available. Typical itinerary here, uh, again, would be a Ketchikan, Juneau, Skagway, ICE, whether that's Glacier Bay or Tracy Arm. The important thing to note here is that obviously, as we all know, or maybe you don't know, but those ships that call Seattle that are on a closed loop itinerary, which is Seattle, Seattle, have to call Victoria, have to call a foreign port. So typically what you'll see, although you'll, uh, you'll see that a Seattle ship would go Juneau, Skagway, Glacier Bay, Ketchikan, the port call in Ketchikan is limited to only about a six hour call from six to 1300 because they need to take that, uh, they need to call Victoria prior to getting into Seattle. Another alternative, another example of a northbound itinerary, you could do Ketchikan, 
Juno Tracy Arm, same day, Skagway, Day at Sea, Victoria back into Seattle. So all this goes into play as it relates to juggling the ports, not only with Ketchikan, but also Juno, Skagway, Icy Strait, Sitka, whatever that may, that may be. And last but not least, uh, well, I shouldn't say that because there's one other after this, but you have your Vancouver to Anchorage, which is either Vancouver, Whittier, and or Seward, and we refer to these as the open jaw itineraries. Typically, an open jaw itinerary would be Ketchikan, the first stop, Juneau, Skagway, Glacier, uh, Glacier Bay, and or Hubbard Glacier, depending on, depending on whether the cruise line has uh, permits to operate in Glacier Bay, and then Seward. The important thing to note here on this itinerary, uh, as it relates to priority in each of the individual ports, is a northbound itinerary, for example, if a ship's departing out of Vancouver on a Friday, they would call Ketchikan on Sunday. Of course, now, when they get to Seward, it'll be another Friday. These are seven-day itineraries, and when they get to Seward on their return trip, they would be in Ketchikan on Wednesday. And historically, the way these work, that that ship, that member, that line calling both northbound and southbound would have priority uh, not only in Ketchikan on Sunday and then on their northbound, but also in Ketchikan on their south by, southbound itinerary on a Wednesday. And this is another <clears throat> example of an itinerary we see, and this is a uh, typically a 10-day out of San Francisco. And it's important to note here in that when you're on a 10-day round-trip itinerary, you're not going to fall in the same port on any given day of the week. And so here we have the flexibility of doing uh, San Francisco, Ketchikan, Juno, Skagway, or at times if Ketchikan's not a viable option on the on one particular day, they can make that run from San Francisco to Juneau. It's a two day at sea, and then the next day would be either in Ketchikan or Juneau. So we have a little bit of flexibility depending on port congestion and other ports to, to manipulate this itinerary to make it work. Uh, the next uh, topic of discussion is uh, that I think it's important to know that uh, are any cruise lines excluded from this process? And um, I think it's important, here it's important to note that obviously there's other cruise lines that may look at wanting to come into the market. Uh, are they excluded? Absolutely not. Um, uh, CL, we at cruise line agencies work cooperatively with many of the cruise lines, look at placing a ship in the Alaska market. Um, we work closely with deployment and their operation teams deter to determine whether or not Alaska would be a viable option, okay? This isn't only true for any new cruise line wanting to come into the Alaska market, but for the existing ones that are already here. And, uh, and that means if they're looking at bringing an additional ship, a bigger ship, a larger ship, we spend uh, a lot of time working with their port ops people even ship development people, uh, as it relates some of the things that we look at, the first, the most important thing that we look at and working with them is whether or not the ship fits in Alaska. You may say, well, what do you mean, does it fit in Alaska? Well, uh, the infrastructure that we have shoreside, the facilities that that ship ties up to, we need to be able to make sure that one, uh, the, the docks that we do have in place are capable of accommodating that class ship um, they have ship characteristics, whether or not we have overhanging lifeboats, uh, anything that sticks over the side of the ship that may impact the ship from not being able to call Alaska. Those are all the things that we look at. Um, an example, a couple of examples that would be important to note is Disney Cruise Line. When they looked at coming into the Alaska market, we worked with them for five or six years before they even ended up placing a ship in Alaska. So, um, Another member line was looking at replacing an additional ship uh, or an existing ship in Alaska with another ship. When they showed us their plans as to whether or not they can bring that ship in the Alaska market, it was determined that they had overhanging lifeboats that wouldn't fit not only any dock in Ketchikan, but anywhere in Juneau and or Skagway or any port within Alaska. So we were, we were able to work with their team and be able to draw their lifeboats up inside the hull of the ship so they wouldn't extend outside the ship to where, again, we could accommodate them in Alaska. So there's a lot of things that we do as cruise line agencies, one in marketing the port, not only Ketchikan, but the region of Alaska, 
and certainly when any time that we're visiting on our customers, we're always looking for the new guy. Uh, we've had conversations with MSC for the last 10 years trying to work on itineraries to get them up here. We've had itineraries in place for them to come, and uh, they just at this point have, haven't pulled the trigger, and we continue those negotiations. And, and I think the important thing to note is uh, any time that any cruise line wants to come into this market, you know, uh, we work cooperatively with them in making sure that they, uh, that they can get the ship in, into Alaska. And there's a lot of other things other than outside the characteristics of the ship as to whether they can get alongside. We have environmental issues we deal with, uh, regulatory issues we deal with as it relates to holding capacities of gray and black water, uh, right on down to smoke emissions and everything else. I'll try to speed this up because I know Kari is chomping at the bit to get up here. So. <clears throat> um, this is another uh, thing that, uh, that I think that we often get asked the question is, how are annual dock assignments determined? Um, well, I've already spoke a little bit about how we get a ship into the Alaska market and to the characteristics of that ship and whether or not they even fit not only here in the Port of Ketchikan, but Juneau, Skagway, Sitka, or any other new berth that's built throughout uh, Alaska. Uh, so ship characteristics such as size, length, location of gangway, access points, uh, and even right on down to mooring lines. Where are we going to place the ship uh, mooring lines uh, once in alongside? Uh, ship scheduled times and arrival departure times and direction of travel play uh, uh, is part of that decision-making process. Whether they're northbound, southbound, whether they fit at berth one or not fit at berth one, one ship may have characteristics where they can fit at berth one northbound but not southbound, so that's taken into consideration. Uh, dock characteristics, um, such as the height of the pier, uh, location, type of mooring bollards, and then available service services to that gangway, whether or not ship needs to, as in some cases the smaller ships, whether they need to bunker or take on fuel or whatever that may be. Uh, and then there's also a lot of navigational and operational constraints that we work with, and we work closely with some of the pilots in determining what, whether or not what ship, what ship would fit at what dock or would be a, a viable option in accommodating that class ship. <clears throat> Who's all involved in the annual uh, dock assignment decision making? Again, uh, cruise line agencies determines the first draft of dock assignments. And again, that's based on, pre on the previously mentioned elements I talked about. Uh, once <clears throat> we then, once w we will develop a draft, once we have that draft in place, of which we believe is pretty close to what we believe makes most sense operationally, uh, we will turn that over to uh, ports and harbors uh, director. And in fact, uh, uh, we just had recently gone through that review. Uh, the approved draft is then presented to the public meeting at the Ports and Harbor Advisory Board. Um, the public uh, and all stakeholders may attend that may, uh, meeting and uh, make comments and or suggestions. And then any adjustments to the dock assignments are made based on that public meeting and as if necessary and or possible. So. We'll certainly take, we'll do the draft assignments. We turn it over to uh, Ports and Harbors. They review it. We work uh, closely with Ports and Harbors director. Uh, we look at all the different options and uh, uh, certainly after his review, we, uh, he'll, he'll offer up some suggestions. We'll look at those, but it's uh, clearly vetted not only with uh, after we do the initial assignment, but it's clearly vetted with uh, ports and harbors on the, on the final draft of that uh, dock assignment. These are some of the pictures that we take, uh, that we use, models that we use in assigning birth assignments. Um, uh, here's an example of, uh, you can see the nose of the ship at birth three. The ship that you're looking at here now is the uh, uh, a Prince's ship at birth two with the Holland America ship at birth one. Off the top of my head, this is probably a Thursday in Ketchikan in which we will place the New Amsterdam at birth one with the uh, uh, Crown Princess at birth two. Some of the things here again that we look at are gangway locations and accessibility uh, to those gangways, and more importantly, the mooring lines as to whether or not we have enough mooring bollards and or points to uh, safely accommodate the ship in alongside the berth. 
Um, again, this is an example of Ketchikan, but, and here's an example of Juno. We do the same in Juno. We go through, identify the birth assignments there as it relates to the characteristics of each of the individual ships calling on any particular day. And uh, essentially, you have four ships in port. You try to figure out which four docks that they would fit or we'd be able to accommodate each of those class ships. And this is uh, Skagway where we have, uh, it looks like a Monday in Skagway where we have a Royal Princess forward with the quantum of the seas aft. Uh, I, you can look at the distance between the two. You're looking at about 15 to 20 meters anywhere from 50 to 60 feet. If you have ever stood on a bridge of a ship and looked down at the nose of the ship you're standing on, in comparison to the ship that's in front of you, you think, oh my God, we're touching it. It's, it's pretty close, but anyway, there again, you see the mooring points that, uh, that we design. We share these with the masters we, um, uh, of the ship uh, the day before their arrival, so they have a pretty good idea of where, where the mooring points are on those ships. Last but not least, I'll talk a little bit about a, a, what a ship agent does. I get asked the question all the time. Um, and I think I can summarize it really in one sentence in, in that uh, we provide shoreside support for any cruise line that calls not only the Port of Ketchikan, but any community throughout Southeast Alaska. Um, here are some of the things that we're involved in, in, in a chronological order. We talked a little bit about uh, statewide scheduling. We do that. Um, uh, prior to ships coming into the, into uh, Alaska, we make sure that uh, we go that they fill out all the environmental registrations, the liquor license, the business licenses. We work cooperatively with the sea pilots on scheduling, as it relates to timings in and out of port. Obviously, we provide them the schedule, and we work cooperatively with them, and. Uh, uh, in coordinating not only where we put the pilot on, take the pilot off, we schedule the pilot boats. Once the ship's in alongside, we work closely with Customs and Border Protection to enter and clear the ship. Uh, we work cooperatively with uh, AMAC towing and uh, through tug coordination as to whether or not tugs need ships. Uh, we board rangers in Glacier Bay. Uh, we coordinate the longshoremen of tying up the ships. And more importantly, we do all the crew transfers, medical evacuations, emergency traveler assistance. People that miss ships, we'll take them to the airport. And if the captain wants Charmin toilet paper, we'll go get Charmin toilet paper. So in a nutshell, it's uh, uh, essentially, we, again, we just say any demands that uh, are required by the line, once they're here, we, we're here to accommodate. Thank you, and if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer. I know that's a lot. It's kind of a high-level overview. If any of you ever want to stop by our office and have an in-depth conversation about scheduling, I'm more than happy to. Thanks, Rick. Any questions? I just wonder, is there a copy of this presentation somewhere that we can go back and refer to it if we want to? Absolutely, I have one sitting over here on my desk. Excellent, so, thank yeah, you. A hard copy and we can probably send you a pretty one uh, on the- I'd like the pretty you one. You want the pretty one, no problem. <laughs> thank you. And again, I, it's a lot and at any time you guys have any questions, our door's open for you guys to stop by any time to where we can further explain the, 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 this process. Because that's half of it. Ms. Bradbury, and then Ms. McClellan. Thank you, Rick. I appreciate the presentation. Um, so one, one concern or issue you hear a lot from the citizens is why does Holland America have to be at dock one when we have this beautiful, gigantic ship sitting out in Anchorage and that historic berthing doesn't necessarily benefit everyone in our community, even though that's how, how it's done. Um, the question is, can Ketchikan get away from historical berthing in specifically just in Ketchikan, or is it something that has to be done on a much larger scale with all of Southeast Alaska? I think you need to be careful when you ask that question because I think my response to that would be that you have to remember who buttered your bread and that you have Hall in America and or a princess and some of these guys that have been calling here since 1980 and are instrumental in building the infrastructure in this port it, it, as it relates to the number of years they've called here. But actually, I think it's really a model that's worked 
here in Alaska, um, historic priority. Um, I've heard a number of lines say that uh, they wish that this model was, was used elsewhere. Um, to answer your question, as it relates to birth assignments and how they're allocated, again, a lot of that is based on the characteristics of the ship, of where we get passengers on and off, uh, to the, the size of the vessel. Uh, for example, um, I hear a lot that, you know, why do only the larger class ships go to berths three and four? And, uh, but yet again, I can sit here and tell you, well, the quantum doesn't fit at berth three or four, but it fits at berth one and two. We need a combination of those two. And, but again, you can only have that one ship on berth one and two. So why do the larger ships go to three and four is the, so we can accommodate two ships on one and two. Um, I, I think it would probably, I mean, that's a tough knot. I, 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 think, I think on a, a conversation would be had as to whether or not if what you're asking to take a Seven Seas Mariner and put it along, uh, why it's alongside a dock and while a larger ship is at anchor. And again, that model is just really based on historic priority. And I think what you're referring to is you have a San Francisco ship of which is on a 10 day itinerary and is dropping in on a day of the week which all four berths are filled and those four berths that are filled are occupied by those that have had historic priority. Did that answer your question? Yeah, I was just trying yeah. to um, have it explained to um, the citizens on what yeah, are the difficulties I, I, of switching it, out it is. I, certain I mean, ships. Yeah, I mean, and again, what else I would say is uh, the model that we have now seems to work in working with the member lines of which they've agreed to operate under. So, Thank you, Rick, for the presentation and the clarification. This body really needed it. I have a question just for conversation's sake. If this body hires a tourism manager and say for conversation's sake, again, makes an agreement with Costa to bring a ship here. Now, cruise lines will not come to one port. So who do they have to go through? Do they have to negotiate with every port or do they go through cruise line agencies to make sure that they have an itinerary? Well, as I... As I noted in my conversation, and uh, the, the normal rule of thumb is they, they'll come through us. Um, and more, more importantly, you know, we're out maybe three, four years in advance working with whomever may want to come, for example, an MSC or a Disney when they came into the market. And there are a number of things that you need to look at before you can just say arbitrarily come to Alaska and say, hey, we want to put a ship in here. And one of them doesn't work. Um, and, and Two, we work closely with them in identifying an itinerary that would work around the historic priority model that we have in place. And more often than not, we're pretty successful in doing so. Um, now, that may not be a typical day out of Vancouver on a, a, a Friday or Seattle on a Friday, Saturday, or Sunday, but there are opportunities to find a day of the week in which you can operate either out of a Seattle or a Vancouver, that may be a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday, that we can build a seven-day itinerary that may have a Ketchikan, Juno, Skagway, although those are challenging ports to get all three on any one given itinerary, but now that we have other options with an icy strait and a Sitka and the bursts that they, they have in those ports, that we've been pretty successful so far in identifying different itineraries to be able to attract other cruise lines into Alaska. I think what we're seeing here now is some of the flexibility of some of the other lines wanting to come into Alaska knowing that maybe a seven day normal itinerary isn't gonna work like the one I showed you is a Vancouver, Vancouver and that they're getting a little more creative and maybe they only do a six day and or a seven or an eight day which then puts them on different days of the week where maybe a catch can may be available on a Wednesday a Juno may be available on a Thursday, and a Skagway would be available on a Friday. And if that was a seven-day itinerary that went into the next voyage being an eight-day itinerary, they fall on a different day of the week where that, those ports may be a viable option. So yes, the flexibility is there to continue to work with any member line that wanted to come into Alaska to develop an itinerary that we can accommodate them. 
And certainly our, I think, uh, I think any conversations that we have with any industry members is that, you know, you still have Ketchikan Juno as the big three. I mean, that, at, along with the glacier, uh, that's what an itinerary is gonna look like in a seven day. And so how do you fit all those, those three ports and or whether or not, if one's not available, maybe Sitka and Icy Strait. But. Thank you so much for the clarification. Any other questions? Do you have a question from the audience? Go ahead, Mary. Thanks for the question. Uh, uh, for scheduling ships in Ketchikan, it has made my job a whole lot easier, I can tell you that. Because we do have berths available on certain days of the week. So what I would say to that is, obviously, when, you, when we're, mar we're talking about marketing in Alaska, uh, we're not specifically talking about Ketchikan because you just can't bring a ship into Ketchikan on Wednesday and have it go back to Vancouver. They want to go to other ports throughout the region. And so it becomes challenging in knowing one, the holes are on Tuesday and Wednesday here in Ketchikan. But are the other ports north of us open? And that would be a, a Juno, a Skagway. Historically, typically, Juno's full on Wednesday, Thursday, Skagway's full Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, maybe some options on Friday. So you'd have to really get creative on trying to figure out an itinerary that would fill those days of the week. But with that said, now you take your 10-day San Francisco ship and your six-day Seattle voyage, maybe they're moving into, or, or an eight-day, or we're starting to see eight, nine-day voyage itineraries uh, come out. I know NCL is, uh, has a couple of those on the market. Now those days we can figure out how to plug those into those days especially when they're alternating days, uh, at their departure days out of Seattle. So we're certainly here uh, pounding the drum for Ketchikan and trying to figure out a way to fill those days of the week. But the issue is the other ports up the line and trying to, you know, uh, to, to get them not only Ketchikan, but other ports or other destinations throughout Southeast. Kind of piggyback off of that question, I think that raised an interesting point, but it seems that Sitka now being more equipped, is there potential that, say, with those open berths here in Ketchikan due to the loss to Ward Cove, is there potential where flexibility to work with, say, rather than having to try and squeeze in Skagway and Juno to go like Sitka and Juno, or, or is it yeah. See what I'm getting at? Is there more flexibility to go to those other ports? Or? Yes, absolutely. And having Icy Strait with two ports, having Sitka now adding two berths, keep in mind Sitka has, has always been able to accommodate four ships at anchor. So Sitka was always a viable option on any itinerary that you want. But now that they've added the two berths, it becomes more attractive. And so, and Sitka has had their historic calls as well. Um, there are some ships that call Sitka that do not call Skagway. Um, so yeah, it certainly opens up the opportunity to be able to attract a ship here in Ketchikan on a particular day of the week and then maybe the following day in Sitka. The problem that we're dealing with if Ketchikan's two open dates on Tuesday, Wednesday, guess if they called here Tuesday, guess what? Sitka, Sitka's bursts are full Wednesday. And a lot of that has to do with the deployment during the weekends out of Vancouver, Seattle, filling up the midday weeks. Did that answer your question, Riley? Yeah, I was just okay. curious, thank you. Any other questions? Oh. You? Earlier in the presentation, um, you were talking about historical birthing and why that's important because the folks that get historical birthing are the people who helped um, basically build this industry. Do they pay for that? Do they 
pay for the opportunity to have historical birthing? No, it's just a practice that's used that, that we've used uh, uh, ever since I've been here with this job. And, and, then, and, and Judy, I, I'll tell you, you know, the historic priority probably originally started with Glacier Bay in that when Glacier Bay opened up it, for permit, you need a permit to operate in Glacier Bay. Right. And only certain cruise lines had those permits at the time, I believe, were Princess, Holland, um, NCL, and I don't believe RCI at the time had them. They may have, but that kind of dictated the day of the week in which those member lines could call there on a specific day. And, and this model was here well before I got here, and I, I think over a period of time, that was just the model that industry agreed to work with on the historic priority day. And again, we have a list of Ketchikan, Juno, Skagway, and on that list, I have each of the members' lines where they where their priority is in that particular port on any one given day. So, for example, um, Holland America and Princess, since they've been calling here in the mid '70s, hell, maybe even '60s under Sitmar days, if you want to go that far back, but. If you were to look at Ketchikan and Juno and Skagway, I could tell you that Ketchikan and Juno, and I'll just list the first two, would be Ketch would be Princess and Holland or Holland America Princess and Holland America Princess in both. However, in Skagway, uh, Holland America didn't call Skagway, so in the pecking order for the uh, historic priority in Skagway, I believe Holland is actually fifth because they didn't call Skagway; they actually called Haynes. So once they moved into Skagway, they then got in uh, in line for port priority for the port of Skagway. Okay, I guess I'm trying to, um, as I recall with the RFP, there was something called preferential berthing. And I'm trying to figure out what's the, it sounds the same to me, historical uh, berthing, yeah. preferential berthing. If we're offering those berths, to those lines because they helped build the industry. I'm just trying to wrap my head I, around the difference. You know, I, I probably misspoke saying that I, because, I, I mean, again, it was the, the, the number of lines that we had calling in Alaska at that point in time certainly wasn't what we saw here today or what we see here today. Um, but again, it was uh, as far as the scheduling uh, that we operate under or do, I mean, for lack of a better term, we just call it historic priority, that, you know, obviously they've been here, they've been not only calling Alaska, but we've made it port specific as it relates to how long that member line has been calling each individual port. And then, uh, two, it, even more importantly, we've even narrowed it down to the day of the week they were in that port. And I think the benefit of having historic priority, it gives industry a certain level of comfort in knowing year to year that they can operate those same itineraries year after year after year, uh, of which essentially makes my job a lot easier as it relates to, okay, we know that Hall in America typically opts a seven day uh, uh, Vancouver, uh, seven day Vancouver, Vancouver with the same itinerary each and every year. They operate uh, three Seattle itineraries with the same itineraries every year. Uh, they, o they operate uh, two open jaw ships with the same itineraries opposite of one another year after year after year. And so what, what that means year after year, they're in the same port, pretty much the same given time every day of the week, whether they're northbound or southbound through that. So it builds some assurance that they will always be able to continue to operate and market Alaska in a sense, what they've historically done. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very good question. It's, it's, uh, okay, thank it's you. a tough one. Anyone else? Ms. Brebery. I guess to piggy off, uh, piggyback off of uh, Councilmember Zingy's question is, you know, we've, um, through the RFP process, a lot of cruise lines themselves talked about, you know, don't give out full port management, but let's do preferential berthing. Um, and that they would be then paying for you know, that special spot that they wanted every week. So if we were to, you know, say the council was like, hey, yeah, let's, that sounds great, let's move forward with that, and the cruise lines are the ones coming to us for something like that, how would that work in this, this picture if, you know, we decided to go with the preferential 
birthing outlook here specifically in Ketchikan? Because it was brought up frequently during the RFP. Yeah, I guess my question to you is, what would that model look like? I'm just posing I, I a don't, question. Because I yeah. don't know. I mean, are you going to go out and offer one line preferential birthing over another line that's going to bring one ship into the market over another line that brings seven ships into Ketchikan? Mm -hmm. You never know which line I, it could I don't know. Be. That, so that would be, I'm just so saying, that would be a question that just you guys would have to wrestle with. Posing that question as if we chose as a council to go forward that way because we had these proposals to us, how yeah. would that, you know, how would that relationship work with you guys and your your scheduling? I guess that's what I'm trying to get down to. Well, is how does I, that relationship work in, in terms of scheduling catching? I guess if if you were to go down that road, obviously I would know I need to know whom and when, and then that changes the whole game as it relates to how I schedule ships and catch can, and certainly can upset the whole apple cart through, uh, I shouldn't say certainly, but maybe some of those other member lines may say, okay, well, we lost this day here. Who's to say, and, and I'm, I don't know whether they'd say, well, why come any day of the week then? You know, for that other line that maybe got kicked out. But that's a tough, that's a tough question. For me to sit here and answer, what would the industry think of? I, I know that if that's what happened here, then we would have to certainly schedule around that of what that would look like. Um, I had the opportunity to go to your office when I first joined the council uh, to see how you did all the scheduling. And I, that was very helpful for me. I actually thought that all those little cardboard cutouts were made especially for me <laughs> because you thought I'd never understand it. So I was really pleased to hear that that's something you use every day. But my question is, you know, now we're getting a new port director. Will he be included? Will he have a seat at the table um, with what you guys are doing when you're working on scheduling, when you're doing on other things? I think that from my perspective, I think that would be important for him to really learn about the industry. I would think that the first day Mr. Hilson brings your new port director to town, that maybe his first meeting be with us. Yeah, I would think and so. you know what? We're, we've, we've always had an open door policy. We're happy to sit down and explain how the process works. Mark and I have had a great relationship in the short time he's been acting. Uh, Mr. Corper and I had a great relationship as, as, as we go through this process. Um, but again, in scheduling catch, we're not only scheduling the port of Ketchikan, we're scheduling the entire state of Alaska and how that all works. And I'm more than happy at any point in time during that process if Mark or anyone of his team wanted to be fully engaged in how all that works, we're happy to sit down and, and, and explain to them what we're doing and why we're doing it. So to whatever extent. Well, I, I'm more, if he wants to spend the late hours up uh, until midnight going through trying to figure out whether it fits or not fits. But yeah, I mean, I, I have nothing. To, uh, I'm more than happy to share with him of what schedules I've received. In fact, I'm more than happy to sit and uh, at, at a point in time where we get all the schedules and we print all the ports out. The way it works is I'll print Ketchikan, I'll print Juno, I'll print Skagway, I'll print all the ports, and I'll see that I have... Uh, seven, eight ships in Juno. And it's like, okay, what are we gonna do with this? I mean, we have, uh, we obviously we have a conflict because Juno can only accommodate four ships on any one given day with one at anchor. But it's pretty easy to identify, again, based on historic priority, who was called there before because you see a lot of the same ships as I just early spoke about. You're having the consistency of each, each and every year, those ships calling that particular port on any given day that, okay, we're going to see the Royal Caribbean, Celebrity, Princess, and Holland here this day, and then we have these oddball ships on r different itineraries outside the norm. Well, we need to then go work with them to figure out an itinerary that would work, not excluding Juno or Skagway or Ketchikan or wherever that conflict will be, but how, we, how can we change that port rotation to make it work for that individual ship? And so it's really a... Uh, well, as you can see, it's really a puzzle of how all this stuff is put together and um, uh, certainly time consuming. Again, once we receive all the schedules, it's, a, it's about a two or three month process in manipulating it. 
and trying to want to identify the conflicts and try to come up with suggested resolutions for the cruise industry as it relates to what they want to do. And I think the important thing to note out of all this, we're just nothing but the facilitator on behalf of the member lines. They send us our, the schedules. We don't make up their schedules. They send us their schedules. And then through the, through the process that we have available to us as it relates to historic priority, we work with each of the individual lines to help solve any of those conflicts that are, exist. Thank you. But yeah, I, I think Mark and I've already talked about that. When, when he gets there, certainly we'd want to open invitation for sure. I believe there's a person in the back has a question for you. like what the preferential birthing versus the historical birthing, is it even possible to have one porch operate under preferential birthing when the rest are using historical birthing? Can you have, can you make it work with two different models in different ports? So if Ketchikan went to preferential but Skagway is still using historical birthing, do those work together? Uh, a difficult question. Um, if that were the case, I would certainly try to make it work. But I, th I think there's a whole different dynamic here, too, that we have to take into consideration, or at least we do. Um, Juno has two private docks, of which you have the Franklin dock and the AJ dock, of which are privately owned. And they have agreements in place with some of the, the lines on certain days of the week to use that. Um, Sitka's private dock, again, even though being private, they too follow the historic priority to the point. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know what that model would look like as it relates to if one had preferential birthing and the other didn't. Um, I guess for me as a facilitator of scheduling cruise ships in Alaska, I just would need to know what those rules are. And then I'd work cooperatively with them, each of the member lines and trying to figure out how we can put an itinerary together for all of them. Did that help? One more, Mary. Um, as other boards are talking about limits and capacities, um, I can understand the scheduling is as it is, but can you say to the ship, your capacity is 4,000, but this particular city is only allowing so many in the port at any one time, it seems reasonable that we're doing limits versus restricting any one ship because it's scheduled. It's easier for your job to say limits instead of saying no to a third day. Um. Hey, I, I, I've never been one to say, no, you can't come. Yeah. And, Two, if I can get you here, we're going to get you here. Um, the second point of that question is I'm not aware of any limits on passenger capacity. Again, I, I'm not aware of any limits or restrictions, but if in fact they were to limit, whether it be five ships a day or a number of passengers, that's something, or if Ketchikan elected to do the same, that's something that we would, as industry, would have to obviously take into consideration and figure out how we're going to massage that schedule or determine how we're going to get to meet that passenger number. Um, but I can tell you, uh, I'm going to schedule ships in the port of Ketchikan to fill your berths to, to capacity, if I can, unless I'm told otherwise. I mean, really, if I, if I know that the ship wants to come to Ketchikan and there's a berth available, it's coming to Ketchikan. But that ship in this port is going to be Juno that says we have a limit on capacity. Well, where are they going to unload 1,000 people from Ketchikan to use Juno? Oh, if, if that was the case, Mary, I think what would ultimately happen, we'd take the ship here in Ketchikan, and if Juno didn't want them, we'd find another place for them. I don't know. I mean, maybe you go to Sitka. Maybe you go to Icy Strait. Unless what you're saying that if 
another port, and I don't want to specifically point out Juno here at this point, says we're not going to take a ship that carries any more than 3,000 people, then we're not going to, leave, we're not going to take a 3,500 passenger ship here in Ketchikan and unload 500 people here in town to send them to Juno. Yeah, I um, I guess what I would say is I, I'm, I wouldn't think that the cruise line would limit the amount of passengers that they would place on their ship. I think their goal is to, obviously, they have a lower birth count of passengers that are that it's designed to carry. I, I would think that the cruise lines would continue to market to fill their ships. Um, if there is any... <clears throat> If there was any port that wanted to limit capacity, uh, the number of passengers in port on any one given day, any one given week, or any one given year, then we'd have to we'd have to ma uh, massage the schedule to accommodate. And I'm not sure how I'd go about doing that, but um, but I, I would I would say we cross that bridge when we get there if it happens. Any other questions for Mr. Erickson? Okay, thank you, Rick, very much. Yeah, appreciate thank you. it. Okay, next we have Kari Erickson, Director Southeast and Yukon Operations, HAP Alaska Yukon. Oh, yeah. I need to pull this down from the Jelly Green Giant. Anyway. <laughs> there you go. My total of 5'4, not 5'3. <clears throat> Perfect. All right. Well, thank you for uh, having me speak tonight. My name is Kari Erickson. I'm with Hap Alaska Yukon, um, motor coach operator, and I, I reside here in Ketchikan, but I also oversee the motor coach ports in Juneau, Skagway, and then our hotel operations um, in Skagway and up into the Yukon. So it's kind of nice because it affords me the opportunity to see how different areas, um, different areas within the region kind of handle some of the issues. So gives me some, some good perspective for um, bringing things back home. Uh, the motor coach piece that I'll explain is not tied as directly to the marketing of guests or ships as some of the other speakers that are, that are up here. However, it, it does so indirectly by, by helping to create a positive impression um, an experience for the arriving ships and guests um, by having organized and safe dock operations for their, for their arrivals. Um, so as far as industry and port in interactions, um, we as a company feel so fortunate in having the ability to be able to actually pull coaches onto a dock next to a ship. I know that is a fairly foreign thing in, in many, many destinations. And that being said, we, we also understand the, the hazards of working in an environment with pedestrian, buses, and so many other moving, moving pieces and parts that, um, that go on down on the port. Um, I know our company um, definitely always puts safety first, and we definitely appreciate the collaborative um, nature of our relationship with Ports and Harbor staff um, and the ship crew and, and crews on agencies. Um, we have a, a, a dedicated staff um, that work each of the ships that we service, and essentially they act as a liaison between the onboard shore excursion staff, um, many of the local vendors, and then our own coaches that we bring down as well. Um, these, these individuals are in radio communication with each of the coaches and also work with the onboard shore excursion team to ensure that the buses are staged and ready to go at least 20 minutes before uh, the guests come off and are ready to, to, to get onto their tours. Um, they provide the, the local vendors with their bus numbers, um, the location of where the bus is actually located on the pier, because it can be kind of a sea of, of vehicles down there, as I'm sure most of you have seen. 
um, and then coordinate with each of those individual vendors prior to releasing the coaches to go off and have fun and experience um, catch cam. Um, our, our reps also remain on the dock until the ship's all aboard and we'll work with the vendors um, that have ship sold transportation components um, and then also work with the ship to keep them up to date as to um, return times. Um, we have a lot of ships that have short port calls and so many of the tours will be returning right um, at all aboard. So we're, we're down there waiting, keeping um, the communication strong with the ship. Um, and letting them know when their guests are slated to um, be back to the dock. Because while we would obviously love to love to increase our population, that's not the way we want to go about it and have um, angry miss, missed uh, ship guests left behind in Ketchikan. Um, our teams maintain an open line of communication with the port employees and work um, with them to address any concerns related to sa safety or guest experience. Um, for instance, if there's issues with tripping hazards, traffic flow, um, stationary equipment that's impeding optimum loading areas, um, we'll work with, with Mark's group as well as cruise line agencies um, in a cooperative manner to get things moved where possible. Um, we also share our information freely with the city's team um, in hopes of future improvements for everyone and you know, gladly provide coaches or staff to come down and test out different scenarios. Um, on the dock or, or wherever, wherever that is needed. Um, and then as far as dispatching tours, that's a, a Juno picture. I'm sorry, I didn't have a good one in, in Ketchikan. Um, but to, to start at the beginning, when a cruise line decides to um, come to Alaska, they will typically select a primary transportation um, company to work with, along with a multitude of other, other vendors. Um, ranging from fishing to zip lining. And if the vendors who own or operate a, a given tour don't have their own transportation, then they will seek out that um, primary transportation provider and ask them to provide that service for their guests. So um, that happened in Alaska Coach Tours, um, buses that you see running around on the, on the um, roads are not necessarily just our own um, transfers or tours. It's, we're, we're providing transportation for many, many local um, operators in town. Um, the individual vendors themselves will provide their, their departure times and capacities to the ships um, to sell in advance. And that has gone out, gosh, I mean, it used to be every you know six months prior to the ship's call, we'd be looking at giving them um, times. Now they're up two to three years in advance. So they really, really are expanding that, um, that window. It's, it's insane. It's hard to wrap your mind around. <laughs> but as Rick mentioned, that's how, how far out itineraries are being looked at as well. Um, <clears throat> and then so, uh, so all those allocations are provided to the cruise lines. They begin selling. Um, the ships will also sell those tours on board. And then it's a pretty dynamic um, experience because you really don't know what your tours are going to look like or your numbers until the evening before the ship calls. Um, they'll sell right up until that point. Um, and then at that point, um, we will then try to build our, our dispatch, which is, again, like a big puzzle, um, similar to or maybe even worse than Rick's job. <laughs> um, down on the pier, the bus company um, reps uh, will, will work with each of the vendors as well um, the next morning or the, the day of the ship arrival. Um, they'll call the coaches down to the dock as staggered as possible just to try to um, keep things orderly. And if, if backers are required, then our, our reps down there are ready to assist. Um, the reps will hold signs and direct guests to their appropriate buses and then regularly check in um, with the drivers on passenger numbers and report kind of go back and bounce back and forth either be between the, the motor coaches, the, the ship, and then the vendors, just keeping them apprised of, of what the numbers are looking like. So it's a nice collaborative um, experience, I think, for everybody. Um, and then obviously for safety purposes, we always uh, require that our drivers stand at their doors. So we really try to, to keep them there so that we're preventing slips, trips, and falls because we don't want that to happen anywhere, but definitely not on our peers. Um, and then as far as working um, 
cooperatively um, HAP and ACT are obviously competitors, but we're, we're certainly friendly competitors. And in fact, we work um, together quite, quite often on providing charter services on some of our peak days. And um, we meet regularly. We, we typically will do a preseason meeting where we get together and not only discuss port concerns, but potential um, changes community-wide. Um, so it's a, a good relationship. And then as far as challenges and resolutions, we, we really haven't encountered too many challenges aside from the items noted previously, um, such as stationary obstacles on the docks causing safety concerns related to, to gas or even our own equipment. Um, we've, we really love the planters down there, our, our buses, <laughs> and I say that facetiously. Um, but the city's been great and has allowed us to um, put temporary markings on, um, on the entrance to the pier to act as kind of a guide for our coaches, which has been, has been great. Um, and the other piece that has been very, very beneficial, I think, for the guests as well as for us is the crossing guards. They're amazing, um, definitely help improve the guest experience down there and certainly the safety. Um, and then port security has been very helpful in addition to that with um, dispersing, helping to disperse crowds on the piers um, that, you know, they all come off at once, obviously, and everybody's anxious to get out on their tour and at times can spill out into the through fair. So we appreciate the port, um, the port security guards um, assistance out there kind of keeping, keeping people a safe distance away from, from the moving vehicles. And I think ultimately, from, from our perspective, it all comes down to good communication, which I feel has, has definitely happened in the past. And I mean, from us, for, or for us, we are just really, really looking forward to getting back to normal and having a great season and working with, with all of the, the parties again this year. So yeah, so thank you. Thank you. I think I'm gonna yeah. ask the first question. Yeah. So one of the most common comments we get in regards to buses is emissions, fumes. Um, in my prior career, I don't, I don't, I'm not saying this specifically about you guys, but I know that for a lot of fleets, Ketchikan is the repository where they send vehicles to die, that they just aren't good enough for other places. Um, what, if anything, are you folks doing as an industry to mitigate some of these emissions um, that we have going on downtown. We, we do get a lot of comments from folks. Yeah, it, certainly. Environmental concerns are definitely, I mean, at the top of our priority list. Um, and we have, we have several initiatives um, that we currently practice, and I, I can only speak for my company. Um, we have a no idling policy. Um, and that is just a deal breaker, not only for the environment, but it also helps us obviously save on fuel costs. Um, but that being said, you may see, I talked to Jay last year and he, he brought up, oh, we, there was a, a complaint about a, a coach idling. And on inclement weather days, you get all those hot bodies getting, that are wet getting onto a bus, your windows fog instantly. And so obviously, you know, with a, you know, focus on safety, our number one priority is making sure that that driver can see and can um, operate that vehicle safely. So that does require at times to keep the, uh, or turn the, the defrost on and, and get that engine running and get the coach defogged. Um, we also um, have to build air pressure in the coaches, so that may be another time when you might see, oh, they said that they weren't idling, but their bus is, is running. So those would be kind of the two scenarios that are exceptions to the rule. Um, and then as far as reducing um, not only the no idling policy, but we are looking at um, different types of fuel. Biodiesel is something that our company is, is strongly um, interested in. We utilize that in Juneau and are definitely um, considering that here in Ketchikan. So those are kind of our two biggies right now. I would love to say we're gonna get a whole new fleet of coaches, but I think I would probably lose my job if, <laughs> if I made that promise to you. Um, and and I, will, I will point out, Ketchikan, while it may have older equipment, it's not necessarily that they, they come here to die. It's we run 
far fewer miles than a lot of our counterparts in the other areas of the state. So you need newer equipment that can run the go the distance. Um, I'd like to say we have the best mechanics in town too, so um, they're able to keep some of the, the older coaches up and running, which we, we certainly appreciate. Thank you. Other questions? Lovett and then Abby. So there's a lot of money out there for electric infrastructure right now, and I'm wondering if there's any kind of incentive um, that uh, you would take advantage of to maybe start adding some electric buses to the fleet, especially for the ones that are going to have to be right in the downtown. Yeah, and my, that ma the maintenance side is definitely not my exact area of expertise, but our maintenance group definitely is looking at options. I do know that electric coaches are outrageously expensive and may not be the most reliable from what I've heard, um, but definitely that is something that our company is is researching. Yep. Um, kind of to piggyback off of uh, Councilmember uh, Flora's comment on buses, um, isn't there restrictions on height and length in Ketchikan to get around, aka the federal building corner and and so forth that? Um, going to get newer coaches that are often built longer and taller and more of that luxury ride would cause a problem within our streets as they are. Yeah, and we, so we do operate, we operate obviously some of our, our land programs into the Yukon that use those luxurious larger motor coaches, 45 foot coaches. And actually when we were shipping coaches south last spring, we, from, from Skagway, we had one come off here and test the roads downtown, and it did get around okay, but it just it definitely depends upon the, the coach itself. Any other questions? Mr. Tani. Thank you, Kari, mm -hmm. for the presentation. I have one question, mm -hmm. and I get asked this by the local tour operators. When you are picking up, or your buses are picking up tours done by the shore exes, how your, do your coaches accommodate the coaches of the independent tour operators? You mean in this space? Yeah. Oh, of course. You mean how, how do we? I, think, I mean, our, our reps would, I, I would hope, go out and just communicate where coaches are pulling in um, and work to ensure that everybody fits down there, definitely. But it, it is a crowded space, no doubt. Thank you. Uh -huh. Any other questions? Just one follow-up, um, not necessarily a question, but one of a statement of, I think, a, a huge thing that the buses do for Ketchikan that wasn't mentioned is all of these buses that are heading out with a driver, they're also their guide. So they're not only just driving them to point A to point B, but they're talking about the community, pointing out locations, destinations, places to visit, um, and kind of giving them a little bit more of um, – more of the experience and information about our community that they might not get just by getting a, a taxi straight out or um, walking out. So there is that added. Um, I know I've been on quite a few tours and they're, they're pointing out like places to eat and uh, Creek Street and get out to shop and local shops. And so they do have that factor as they ride through all of the community. Thanks, Abby. And definitely, we, our number one goal is to hire locally. So if you know of anybody who's interested in being a driver, we are certainly ready to hire and starting our local training program. <laughs> anybody else have any questions? OK, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Our next speaker will be Krista Hagen, Vice President of Operations, Taquan Air and Kawanti Adventures. Thank you. Thanks, Patty, for queuing up my two slides.
Thank you, Vice Mayor Floor and the City Council members. My name is Krista Hagen. I am the Vice President of Operations for the Alaska Rainforest Sanctuary, also doing business as Kiwani Adventures. That is the South End Herring Cove property where we do bear tours, zip lines, and walking tours. And also we operate at the North End at Whipple Creek Adventure Carts. We also have an operation, a zip line operation in Juneau. So today I'm here to speak about um, how shore excursion operators work with cruise lines to create tour offerings. Also, how do these companies help promote Ketchikan to the cruise industry and their passengers? The second um, topic will be how local businesses engage with cruise industry before, during, and after the season to promote their product and Ketchikan as a destination. And then third, the impact of satisfaction ratings. So I'll start first here with, and Patty, I have a clicker, don't I? Oh, the power is mine. So here's slide number two. I just wanted to show all of the partner relationships we have with the lines. Um, we're very busy, and we appreciate it. Kari mentioned we're looking forward to 2022 to get back to normal operations. In my 15-plus um, years in the industry, I've never seen a gap in operation. So it was something to, um, to navigate around. So, um, and I also want to, you know, emphasize that we, too, are looking for uh, local hires. Um, so we will be working with the KVB on posting those opportunities. Um, so please help us uh, spread the word on that. Um, so starting with shore excursion operations and how do we work with the cruise lines to create um, to create excursions? And that really is to um, to me. So pretty much, I think what we are our legacy business with the lines. We started in the early 2000s and um, worked with the lines at the beginning to determine. Where is there a gap in providing an excursion opportunity? And how do we best represent Ketchikan and all we have to offer in the Alaska experience? What the cruise lines are looking for are wide open spaces. They're work looking for cultural experiences. Um, they look for what, what, what are the local experiences in food and beverage. And also, um, they're looking for wildlife. So we look at an, an adventure. Uh, so what is the customer looking for? And how can we supply that, um, that experience? Once we assess that, then we start vetting opportunities and, and adventure options, if you will, or um, on the, uh, the flight seeing side, I should say, I also work um, for the business development side of Taquan Air, um, is we look at where, what, first of all, what would be our impacts to the environment and to the locals, and then we also do a cost-benefit analysis on any type of um, tour infrastructure that we'd be putting in place. That includes um, capital investment and then ensuring that we have the relationship with the, with the partner lines to um, have longevity with them. So it's working in, in uh, close collaboration with them um, to identify where we can create um, those tour experiences. And then once we get into an agreement with the line on what that experience will be, we start working on capacity and what can we provide to, the, to each and every line. Um, we work closely with um, their marketing teams to ensure that they're promoting accurate uh, experiences so that we're not misrepresenting or under-delivering what we promise to the guest when they come to Ketchikan. We're constantly auditing their websites to ensure that we are represented correctly in all aspects of the tour experience. Um, and also, we work with them on an annual basis to determine, are we offering the right thing? Are there things that we need to tweak? And is there value added that we should provide that creates a standout product to represent Ketchikan? So those are all nuances that we work closely with their marketing programs and their shore excursion departments. Um, so the way we work with them Pre-season is we do assess our agreements annually. Some, we do have a couple lines where we have multi-year agreements, but we address those. We look at um, we have to look at what our um, any cr increases happen this year. Inflation is incredible, so we are looking at those impacts so that we can be sustainable. We're not necessarily protecting our margins year over year. We know that the cruise lines absolutely do, and so we want to make sure we're competitive in the market. And so, um, you know, it is it is something that while um, there is a lot of supply out there, uh, the demand um, really needs to equate so that we're we're make we have that cost benefit, and the return on investment. So that's preseason. We identify to make sure that we have the insurance levels that, that are required. They're very high um, as far as the liability limits, and they're very expensive on all ends, on the adventure side and flight scene. So we ensure that our um, insurance levels do meet theirs contractually. And then, um, and then we also ensure that we have the allocations uh, and the operational um, 
inventory to execute what we promised two years prior. So there is an assumption that we will continue the partnership year over year, two years out. As Rick had mentioned and Kari mentioned, we cert we're working on 2023 block allocation. And that again is assuming that, um, and we're assuming the risk that our assets are committed to the lines. So, um, so there is a liab uh, liability and risk in, in ensuring that we are gonna be operational and have those, um, those assets available to the lines in two years. So then um, during the season, we work closely with the on-site um, on shore excursion managers. They're a department on every ship. They're the ones that come off and ensure that the customers know where to go. They liaison directly with us as a partner. And then we also do work with the um, bus companies, Hall in America, uh, the Hall in America Princess Group, the HAP Group, and then the um, Alaska Coach Tours. We work with both of them to ensure that not only do we have the transportation um, directly. So if it's a third party line that the bus company is working with, say for example an NCL, which doesn't have a bus company representative in town, then they'll contract out either ACT or the Hall in America Princess team um, to provide their transportation. That's a third party partnership with us then too, so we'll work with the, with, um, the line that they're contracted with or the bus company that they're contracted with directly. They help also relay that communication on what, um, what is sold for that day, that, that particular day. We'll also coordinate any ADA um, accommodations that we're making, and, um, and oftentimes it'll be where maybe our rep isn't on, on the pier, but theirs is, so we'll communicate with them. So we collaborate very closely with the bus companies, both for third-party cruise lines and direct owner owned cruise lines um, or partnership cruise lines. And then we also um, work very closely with cruise line agencies um, all the time. I mean, pre-season, post-season, in-season. And we work closely with them, especially when it comes to determining what's going to be, what does our future look like here in Ketchikan. We certainly want them to be able to conflict negotiate cruise lines to come to this port on non-peak days because that helps us too. I mean, it, you know, our inventory is peaks and valleys as well. Um, so everyone shares the same peak here in Ketchikan. Um, and then the, the same effect happens um, to our northern neighbors. So, um, so we work with them, and and you know we also are a, continually looking at what opportunities are out there to support any cruise lines that want to come here um, to Ketchikan as the best destination. What can we provide um, the the new cruise lines that are coming? Not only just to market Ketchikan to say, look at what we already have, look at the mature product we have. It's proven product and it's in high demand. So that's how we sell Ketchikan as a premium destination. Um, and then so for post um, post season, again, it's really just um, we go and we visit them. We go to their corporate offices, whether it be in Santa Clarita or Seattle or Miami or Orlando. We're there. And um, we're also going to national industry events um, to represent Ketchikan and to highlight Ketchikan as a port. Um, and so that's really our pre mid and post season um, communication with the, with our um, with our partnership and their year round partnerships with these lines so then um, the next would be the impact of satisfaction ratings so you know it's we have to be five star our if we're not and, and we'll be positioned we get leverage when we're one of the best um, experiences in, in, in port. And we get leverage with that, and we'll leverage that by saying, hey, you know, put us at the top of your website. And I'll tell you the dividends on being at the top of the website for a shore excursion when you're competing with 40 plus in a, in a destination like Ketchikan, where everything is awesome here, is, is really um, a premium. So, and we also get feedback from the shore excursion managers nightly. So we're very proactive. When we have an incident that occurs that's unplanned or unfavorable, we immediately go to the cruise lines. We're completely transparent and we'll tell that representative on the, we don't want them to be surprised by it by a customer and we let them know in advance and we let them know also how we mitigated the impacts of that negative experience because we want the shore ex managers to have a seamless environment with zero hiccups. So we're in partnership with them all the way through the excursion to the um, to the excellent experience that our guests receive. So um, so the collaboration with the onboard staff is critical. Um, and then also, as I mentioned, um, we well, I didn't mention this, but we work very closely with the Ketchikan Visitors Bureau. I'm a board member, um, and I just know that you know the customer service that we um, the customer service 
training that we can get from the KVB. The, we work with them with independent travelers and bookings, um, and the marketing program is so robust that it actually complements what, what I'm doing um, for the companies I represent, um, and it's a critical component. So working closely with the Ketchikan Visitors Bureau, working closely with the cruise line agencies, the local bus companies, and I also work very closely with CLIA on national, on federal um, and state issues with the cruise industry, and also um, working with um, the chamber and also the city and borough. So, um, you know, we as partners do a really good job of collaborating. It's a very mature industry. And I look forward to giving you more information about how we're actually going beyond to be more proactive about our collaboration and our, and our transparency as an industry to work with all the stakeholders and our neighbors in Ketchikan in my next presentation coming up. Vice Mayor, I'm, pr I'm ready to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, any questions? Mr. Matoni. Krista, thank you very much for your presentation. Thanks, I have one question. Not all guests buy tours or excursions or zip lines or even uh, go-karts on board. Do you partner with any local booths or operators in the KVB to sell your product? Or do you have inventory to sell your product uh, independently from independent operators? Yeah, that's a really good question, and that's another part of our business that is really important because, as you know, um, the cruise lines, as Kari mentioned, do sell up to 24 hours in advance of arrival. So um, that's a lot of liability and assets that we're holding that we're not sure are going to be filled. So it's critical for us to be able to capitalize on the independent traveler. And when, the in, when we talk about independent traveler with the cruise lines, it's that traveler that isn't pre-booking an excursion through the cruise line. It's them saying, they're, and they're savvy out there now, so the demand for independent bookings and um, you know when they come into a port on same day is really high so yes both um, the Alaska Rainforest Sanctuary and Taquan Air do use that um, surplus inventory that is available made available the day before ready to sell to the independent traveler who's coming off the pier we do um, bid on city booths so that we can be present down there and we also um, bid on KVB booths thank you other questions? Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, between your two organizations, uh, about how many jobs do you think uh, are provided in the summer going forward this year, for example? Well, this year I'm just not quite sure. My budget scenarios, I might have about five. Um, but in a, good, in a 2019 year, which is a very, very good year for us, I would say that it's just shy of 200 um, employees. In the, for year-round, though, with um, both companies, you know, TAC One Air is operating year-round, but also with the Alaska Rainforest Sanctuary Management Team that is very slim right now, um, we, are, we have about 50 employees. Thank you. Thanks for asking. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Our next speaker is Patty Mackey, whenever she's ready. Right, thank you. Um, I'm gonna keep my comments really brief and kind of just focused on, uh, believe it or not, our contract with you. Um, each year when you approve the operations and marketing funding that you provide for us, there is a scope of work that's attached to that uh, contract. And in that, we say we're going to do certain things for you, for the city and for the community. Um, so I kind of wanted to just walk through those really quickly. Uh, the last time that our scope of work was reviewed and approved by the City Council was a year ago, January, so it's um, a fairly recent update. 
uh, same, actually, you know, really the same kinds of things that we were doing before. I just thought that there was some repetition, so I just tried to clean it up. Um, so among our agreements with you, these are the basically the four things that we do with uh, marketing the community, um, whether it's marketing to independent travelers, um, tr marketing meetings and conventions and the Ted Ferry. Um, but specific to tonight, uh, we have a couple of bullets there promoting catch cam before, during, and after visits by cruise passengers and enhancing relationships with travel industry professionals, which includes the cruise industry, tour operators, travel agents, and journalists to promote catch a cam. Um, we also provide year-round visitor information services, which of course is of benefit to passengers. Uh, when it comes to serving uh, as a, we also serve as a liaison and a community resource to the cruise line industry and their passengers and staff. This was something that um, was implied in previous scopes of work and kind of mentioned in different places, but I put it all together this time. And I'm going to go through kind of what some of the activities are that we do that relates to each of these agreements. Um, and then finally, uh, assisting the city as requested on matters pertaining to the success of the community as a visitor destination for all types of travelers. So promoting catch can before, during, and after visits. And why is this important? Well, the cruise industry thrives on um, word of mouth advertising just like any business does. Um, they want those positive experiences to take place and they want people at the dinner uh, table talking about what a great time they had in each of the ports. That benefits Ketchikan in terms of, uh, you know, making sure that we're always a, a top destination on the cruise ship itinerary. Uh, and as Krista mentioned, uh, the satisfaction ratings, which are such an important part of the individual company's um, relationships with the cruise lines. We want to do what we can to make sure that we're providing the best service. So. In addition to things that you are already aware of, such as our uh, visitor guide, the website, um, you know, we do a lot of uh, training. We offer both customer service training to employees, and we also train people to teach the class Alaska Host, which is specific to tourism, uh, to their own uh, companies. And then, of course, the TVMP, which you're going to hear more about from Krista in a moment. Um, and of course, providing visitor information throughout the community is also an important part of what we do. And then after the visit, um, we get lots of emails, phone calls from visitors who lost something while they were here, um, or they didn't buy enough of the, you know, salmonberry jam that they picked up at one of the stores. Where can I get it? Um, or for Christmas gifts and things like that. So. Uh, we we always enjoy trying to help visitors. Sometimes we have to tell them that it was a different city, but uh, usually we could get them where they need to go. Um, in order to enhance relationships with the travel industry, there's a lot of things that we do that are key to that. Um, for years, I've served on the Alaska Travel Industry Association board and their marketing committee, and I serve alongside cruise representatives um, from uh, several of the lines. Uh, we interact regularly with travel agents. Travel agents and tour operators are uh, huge sellers of cruises, and the cruise lines make special accommodations for travel agents. They, they pay them commission still, probably the only travel sector in the tourism industry that actually still pays commissions to travel agents. So anything we can do to help train and educate them about what's available in Ketchikan means more business for the community. Um, we visit cruise lines and um, meet with personnel from the marketing department uh, when it's appropriate, shore excursions and other divisions. We work a lot with cruise line hosted travel riders while they're in port um, to sponsor and, and host them while they're here. Uh, you're all familiar, I believe, with the Ketchikan Story Project, which was uh, funded specifically as an educational and promotional tool for the cruise industry. So all of the films, all of the footage, all of the photography, every asset that came out of that project 
is available to the cruise lines and has been marketed to them over the years um, that they are able to use any and all of that in their own promotional efforts and sales efforts. Um, and then, of course, we also make available photography, um, our promo videos. We review and uh, edit information about Ketchikan. Uh, we do a lot of those kinds of tasks just to help make sure that the information is accurate. Some of the things that we've done for the city of late, um, you all, I'm sure, remember the resource committee. And of course, while it, you know, it ended up that that, that committee kind of morphed into the Southeast Mayor's Committee, which then morphed into uh, agreements between the cruise lines and the ports and uh, the whole thing. Nobody knew last year where we were going with any of the um, ships returning, but it was a good thing to be prepared and be available. Uh, we conduct research regularly. We gather data on visitor numbers and visitor spending. Um, we have frequently provided information uh, last year when BNA was working on protocol guidelines for the city. Uh, we assisted the city manager's office in getting a hold of businesses that could then provide information. And we provide letters of support, such as the Coast Guard City uh, renewal project that took place uh, the last few years. Um, so those are just kind of a quick review of some of the things that we do that involves working with the cruise industry and interacting with them and their personnel. Um, and uh, happy to answer any questions if you have any. Thank you. Any questions for Patty? You got off easy. Oh, oops. go ahead, Riley. So uh, just kind of shoot us straight. I got the feeling that and maybe I was wrong, so correct me if I'm wrong, but I got the feeling that there was some concern or some disagreement or whatever with us hiring a tourism manager because you guys felt that that was kind of already kind of your gig, for lack of a better word. Is that correct, or can you kind of clarify that? Well, to be perfectly honest, I think this whole work session was intended to share with you what's already being done by industry so that as you continue your conversation about what you're going to do and what that person's duties are, um, yeah, there was some issue, you know, there were a lot of people that were confused at first that, that you were going to try and basically replace what the Visitors Bureau does. Um, and I'm not, you know, I still don't know for sure if that's what your intent is, but what I understood from the meetings and things that I've been to, uh, you're basically looking to market the port. Um, and I am just sharing with you, here's some things that are already happening. So. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Hagen again, uh, KVB Tourism Best, Manages, Ma Best Management Practices Committee. Thank you. Um, First of all, I just got back from Fairbanks, and I think the temperature in here rivals the temperature I just came from, and that was minus 18 degrees. <laughs> Is it just me? Okay. So I'm, I'm, I'm the chair of the Tourism Best Management Practices Committee, which is a committee under the Ketchikan Visitors Bureau. And the, we just recently had a conversation about making this committee a standing committee, but that requires a vote. Um, to change the bylaws, as you all know, that's not easy. So we're going to be well. We, that is an initiative for this next year, so that it becomes um, a long-term um, priority of the Ketchikan Visitors Bureau and staff support, and also board leadership. So um, some of these slides you'll, may be familiar with some of you, as I actually um, stole them from Patty's uh, past presentation. So thank you very much, Patty, for your work on this. And um, essentially, this is a snapshot of the cover page of our, um, of our website. It will be up and active in the next couple months. We're doing some more work on it just to make sure that as we are rolling out the program this summer, uh, that it actually represents all that we intended um, to roll out in 2019 accurately for 2022. Um, I brought this slide up because that is, um, it basically is a sum summation of the, um, the mission of the um, 
the effort of the tourism best management practices. So the reason why I am the board chair, or I'm not, not the board chair, but the reason I am the committee chair, sorry Joe, I don't mean to take away your thunder, he's our chair, um, is because I actually worked on the initiative in Juneau when it um, was created in, and driven in um, the late 1990s. And so I was able, as an operator at that time, was able to um, watch it work and essentially, what was my greatest pleasure was be able to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with those people in the community who felt affected by impacts of the industry, and oftentimes they were unintended impacts. So not only did I get to learn from my neighbors, because I grew up in Juneau, but I also got to respond to them and respond to them in a reasonable way. One was either to educate and to come to um, and a mutual understanding, or number two, to solve a problem that, that I wasn't maybe aware of, or number three, to correct a commitment that we had made on behalf of the tourism best management practices in Juneau voluntarily that we may have felt fallen short of. So that's really what, what I'm excited about this program here today. And so I'll just go to the next slide. So our priorities, and number one is that we provide the community with the means to have questions and concerns addressed in a timely manner by those who are um, impacting um, the, the operating environment in which we're working in. We're going to enhance the visitor experience and catch cans reputation as a top rated destination as a result. And this um, will offer tools and guidelines for in industry partners wishing to practice the high standards. And so this isn't just going to be for those um, mature operators, but it's going to be really great for the new operators coming in. Um, but most importantly, it's going to be for those people who don't feel as if they have a voice to um, raise their concerns, or they feel as if those concerns are raised on deaf ears, or they think it's too big of an industry even to make an impact. So most importantly, it's a conduit for transparency. And the way that we'll do that transparency, I'll share with you here um, as we move forward. So again, the key components are that it's industry-led. When I say voluntary, it means you don't have to, you don't have to sign on. You know, you can just run your operation the way that you do, but we are going to create, there are incentives built in, and we're gonna to continue to look at incentives um, for people to want to be a part of this program. And quite frankly, as we look and sell this to our, our peers in the industry is to say that it's non-punitive if you follow through with the voluntary agreement that you're making in this program. Um, so it really is that base of encouraging stakeholders and community input and community and, and, um, and engagement and common understanding. If we can get to that level, then I think that we can have better harmony and better solutions that actually take into account other people's perceptions of what, are, what is going on. Um, so then, and it's adaptable. The annual review and ongoing opportunities to fine tune this program. We will be re reviewing this year over year. We will be seeking your, your guidance, your feedback. We'll also be re um, seeking, um, we'll be reviewing those calls that come in. We'll be looking at trends. We'll also making, be making sure that those that commit to this program are following through. So the partnership, you know, many people think that if it's being managed and overseen by the Ketchikan Visitors Bureau, it's just the Visitors Bureau membership, and that is absolutely not true. It outreaches to every stakeholder in Ketchikan, and this this is this runs the gamut. I'll show you all of the um, the types of businesses that we're seeking to sign on to this. Um, but it is, it, it's, it's not just those that sign on voluntarily for it to be successful, it's promoting it to our neighbors and everybody in the community to participate so that we, we're only as strong as the feedback we get. Um, but you can see here um, the snapshot of those that we are um, actively soliciting to be a part of this program as operators. Um, and then, and, and we are getting membership, um, we have the membership uh, information for the chamber and Rotary, and we are we're soliciting um, those membership partners as well directly. So it's incumbent on us to ensure that we um, educate the community and promote this program. Um, and so I'll take this opportunity to state that we do have um, uh, upcoming here on the 31st of March um, at Cape Fox in one of their uh, meeting rooms is going to be a public, uh, really it's going to be a public presentation of the TBMP, and we'll have stakeholder or like operator tables that will have subject matter experts on each section of the TBMP by operation to be able to answer questions about 
those um, voluntary compliance initiatives per sector so that if anyone has questions as to, well, what are we going to... What are we going to call in about your business? You know, really, we're there to be able to help um, open up that dialogue to say, this is how you can help us be better. So that's going to be the 31st of August, starting at 6 p.m., and we'll have more information to you, and I'll be, pre I'll be presenting to a, a future um, council meeting at public comments. So the subsection agreements, as I was just mentioning, our subject matter experts will be representing each one of these bullet points in the um, public meeting on March 31st. Every one of these sections is outlined in the TBMP itself. And if you haven't seen the Tourism Best Management pa Practices packet, I'm happy to provide that to you in a link. Um, well, I'll just provide it electronically, but I'll provide copies for that too at the next council meeting. Key components of the program is that the partners agree to implement the appropriate best practices that were identified by the subject matter experts, the key stakeholders, to approximately two years ago. Partners will also agree to address these concerns in an expeditious manner. I believe it's three days in which they have to address a concern. How that's going to work really is that the KVB staff will be, one of the staff members is identified to be the um, the manager of the hotline. So there will be a number that is going to be public and made available to through advertising and just general awareness through the KVB, um, a number that people can call if they have a complaint. And that complaint may not even um, have anything to do with voluntary compliance in the program. It may be something else outside of that. Maybe it's just a question about are you following the regulations within the city, you know? So we're there, and that, and that question will still go to the operator. The operator, whether it's um, relevant to TBMP or not, will still be required to respond to that, and it will be tracked and logged by staff at the KVB. Um, it provides a resource for all partners, including the handbook that I'm mentioning here, the website that we'll be publishing here within the next two months, and again, that phone number. Um, the website also has, and I'll show you here, um, a form where people can go and submit their complaint in writing if they prefer. This is basically an outline of the general agreements in place. Most importantly, it's sharing the responsibility for ensuring that the visitor experience in Ketchikan exceeds expectations. It's that quality, uh, um, the quality, the highest uh, quality port call. So as Patty mentioned, it's all we're going to leverage um, the KVB and their training resources because it does have a com component to train all staff on the TBMP and what we're complying to and what their leadership team is, is signing on to and committing to. Um, and it's self-monitoring, meaning that if we can self-report before it's reported by a state, uh, you know, an industry or even you know a community member, then we're winning. Um, cultural. Protocol is super important. It's this cultural awareness and appropriation and making sure that we're respecting Alaska Natives and the other cultures. So we want to be factually correct. Um, again, in that accurate information uh, um, on accessibility, adherence to federal, state, and local laws, and then the wildlife viewing protocols. So the TBMP website will feature resources that already have guidelines built in, including city ordinances and those types of regulatory requirements that are built in that we already should be complying with. But if there is something that a, um, a volunteer um, organization is not complying with, this is also a conduit, conduit to, to uh, report. So the website is going to be at ketchikantbmp.info. Again, um, we will that'll be live and ready by the March 31st um, presentation at Cape Fox. We'll advertise that publicly um, throughout uh, many of the media outlets. Then um, the hotline there is also via email and phone. So we have three ways to accept feedback through an email, a phone number, and and that, that phone number is actually an answering machine. So it, it reduces the uncomfortable nature of sometimes people talking face, uh, you know, person to person. Um, and um, but we but it can't be. Um, Anonymous, because we need to be able to get back to the person who leaves the feedback as our commitment to the program. This is uh, what it looks like to submit electronically through the website. 
Category is important. I showed you the categories for, uh, for all of the areas in which the TBMP is focused, operating areas. Category is important because we're going to be looking at the feedback we're getting. I believe Juno received in 2019 over 250 comments. Um, so, and, and they're broken out by, by, by category. So you're able to see what the trends are. Um, and, and, and then that is public information. And I mentioned these are the, some of the resources that we'll be providing on that TBMP website. Advertising is critical. We'll be um, uh, promoting member, uh, you know, the vol voluntary members. Um, we'll be also uh, promoting TBMP regularly through um, the paper and um, all other news avenues that we can to ensure that the gen this is just as examples of Juno. And what's great is they paved the way um, to do it right. And, and we're, we're going to piggyback on that and emulate um, their successes. But this is examples of what we will be doing preseason, postseason, and then throughout the year. And that's all I have. So I'm happy to entertain any questions. Vice Thank Mayor. you. Any questions? I thought it was interesting since I uh, heard the presentation a couple of weeks ago that um, I know there was no way to legally uh, control what was going on out there at Herring Bay, but this uh, TMVC, whatever it is, <laughs> um, Close. is <laughs> in BC. Um, anyway, it, it, it's a way for the member groups to actually control it within themselves and they don't have to have law enforcement that that the the group is going to be enforcing their own and so i think it's a very efficient use and um you were talking about having uh, like stickers or something in windows so that you know we are a proud member of type of of thing and i i, I just I think people will start to look for those things. Um, I was wondering on the phone, so the people are leaving a message on an answer machine, how fast uh, do you expect to call them back on that? It's a requirement of the voluntary program to call back within three days. And three business days. The other point, how does three business days equate to a 24-7 operation in the summer? Okay, at any rate, three business days. I'm, I'm assuming it's traditional business days, um, but we can clarify that. But it's three business days, and, um, and then I, if I understand correctly, we loop back to let the representative at the KPV know that that was followed through. Patty, if you yes, don't mind, that's, I'll defer to Patty. That's the intent, is that um, we get a hotline email or phone call that is passed on to the business or organization that was mentioned in the call, they get their three days, they respond back to the uh, individual and also to the KVB so that we can log that information on the uh, spreadsheet that we'll be keeping. And if I may, Vice Mayor, I think I heard a question there just to, to clarify with Lillette, that, that, that um, as far as Herring Cove goes, you mentioned that we self-police. The other, the other thing here is that by operators understanding what we're voluntary and complying to, we're going to hold each other accountable to that. So if I see an operator that might be working outside of the agreed voluntary guidelines, I too can then go to them directly. Now, I could report if I feel as if there is zero response to what I'm seeing, but I'm also considered a community neighbor. So I, I, would, I would also be able to report under that program. I have a comment. I'm very excited about this committee and about making the marketing and presentation on March 31st. I've been part of this committee even before it was a committee. Members of the community, Mr. Richard Harney, Planning Borough, and other stakeholders were part of coming up with this whole agenda, this whole TMBP best practices, what we are putting out there. Juno has it for the last 20 years. It's about time, it's high time we have it so that we are accountable not only to the passengers but to our local community members and citizens. And 
15 years ago, 18 years ago, Juno used to get thousands of complaints. They're down to 15, 20, 70 now. So it's worked well, it's proven, and I'm looking forward to making sure that this works, that every business, every tour operator, every citizen is a part of this. And it will do wonders for our community, for our guests. It will be a win-win experience for everybody. I mean, businesses will have flags, businesses will have decals, businesses will have training that they will respond to complaints or comments. And it is a good thing for the community when the community is not sure whether it's over tourism or whether tourists are being uh, bad towards citizens or other way around. So this is a good thing. It's a long time coming. Thank you, Krista. Is there a fee for members to join this program? There is no fee, Perfect. just a commitment. And then um, one of, obviously there's two purposes of the group, resolve issues with resident or concerns from residents and industry, um, and then enhance visitors' experiences. What exactly, I mean, everyone has a different picture of how to enhance an experience, so what would this program be enhancing for the community? Well, I think what's good for our neighbor is good for our visitor. And so if, the, if our neighbors are identifying areas that either are deemed unsafe or um, other areas that have been identified by industry as vol that we want to voluntarily improve on through just that maybe not be regulated, but something that is a best practice. For example, if you're going to take in a very, um, very high traffic area, um, if, if it's recommended you don't take a left-hand turn because then you're inhibiting traffic flow behind you that would build up and backlog, you don't take a left-hand turn. While that's not regulated by a law or a sign that says one way, it, it's just acknowledging negative impacts by a bus turning left when really it should go right, go, the, go, the, go a different route. So, I mean, that's kind of an example of those impacts. So what, again, I think it's really, it's what is a positive experience for our locals, also trans, for, transitions into a positive experience for our guests. Can I have a follow-up, Yara? And, and then also um, on, obviously, I mean, I wish there would never be a complaint on some city operation, but we aren't that lucky. So um, if it is a complaint on the city, who does that go to to resolve that? Like what, who? Well, city I think what's great or? is that we are providing avenues for which people can provide feedback, positive or negative. We expect these are going to be, this will be critical feedback, which is really good because we can respond to that. We can explain ourselves if we need to. But I know that Patty and staff will take, you know, if it's a, if it's a complaint against the city, they'll take that and give it to the appropriate um, organization. I would, I would trust that would be the case. So there's not one particular person within the city that would be responsible for gathering these concerns? I, I would just jump in and say that's really entirely up to city management. Um, we would ask them, and if the city manager wants to delegate a port complaint to the port director, then that's who we would send it to. But we would start with the city manager and go from there. Not to add anything on to play, I'm just putting it, <laughs> asking these questions. <laughs> no, Councilmember Bradbury, that's absolutely fine. If, if it's obvious or maybe not obvious that you know, the origin of the complaint and how to deal with it, it's fine that it come to the city manager's office. If it's something obvious, like, oh, this is a law enforcement concern, then it can go directly to the police. I think just as long as it finds its way to the correct person, that's the, the main thing. Perfect. And then last thing is um, on these enhancement suggestions or solutions that you may find that's work on a small level, will that be shared with... Um, whoever's in this position over the ports, um, to kind of help lead our way in enhancing the city experience in terms, I mean, we've talked about crossing guards and street closure. I mean, there's numerous amounts. Um, would that information come to us so that we can always kind of see, you know, what, what do we need to look at improving on um, in that area as well to just make us look a little bit better compared to down the street? 
Abby, that's a really good point because this is data collection, right? And, and um, we can take that data and we can use it to make decisions. And if that is decisions and, or information we can provide to ports and harbors and the city and the city council, this body, we certainly would do that. And that information is going to be transparent anyways. So yes, I would hope that anybody who's a stakeholder in the decision-making processes, both public and private, would use this information to make really great decisions on behalf of the city, on behalf of the community, on behalf of Ketchikan. When you say transparent, would that mean that it would be um, posted to the website too, considering that then the community can also take a look at it? I'm going to defer to Patty how that, how that exactly looks like as far as the architecture, yeah. but yes. Yeah, we really base this program on, on how Juno has theirs set up, and, and you could go to their site and see their spreadsheets year in, year out, and see what the comments were. and and uh, resolution. With, off the top of your head, what's their site? <laughs> Juno, Juno TBMP? If you just typed in Juno TBMP, T TBMP, you would be able to pull it up. OK. Any Vice other? Mayor, if I may yes, add absolutely. to that. Um, this is really good. These are really good questions, because I'll be adding the answers to these questions to our presentation on March 31st. So just, um, hmm, I want to have a little fun here. Um, for example, say I decided I wanted to uh, uh, complain about a ghost tour that was um, going through town talking about the many ghosts in various locations of Ketchikan, and one of them happens to be me. and. Um, so would I just write in there, uh, can you please let the ghost tour people know that I'm very much alive and I'm not a ghost, <laughs> um, but I'm very, would love to just come down and dress up in white and yeah. <laughs> well, if you have really great ideas like that, I, I you know, I would be open to those suggestions because I like to create new tours all the time. So, <laughs> but you're absolutely right. It is, um, it's, it's, you know, I don't know if you recall the Mythbuster presentation that was coordinated by the KVB and Patty uh, a couple of years ago when things were quote unquote normal. Um, and it's really, this, this, this is going to be a good avenue for making sure that we can help explain if that is something that needs to be done. If we explain why we represent in a certain way, um, we, can, we can do that. And that's just understanding, you know, what do people perceive a problem? And we can say, great, I'm so glad you identified that, let's talk about solutions. Or great, I'm glad you identified that, we're working on a solution. Or that has been a problem, here's what we've done as a solution, you know. Or maybe we need to look at that again and say, do we, um, amend the TBMP and add new practices. Does, does that answer your Yeah, I, I guess my, statement? my question would be, um, too, is how is it, uh, we're expecting locals to report stuff or as well as people that are visiting because I think one of the main issues would be telling stories that are not true or um, labeling um, fauna that inappropriately or wrong because they were given the idea that they had to name it. They couldn't say they didn't know. Um, things like that. I think it would be interesting to see how we would capture that information. Absolutely. If, it's, yeah. if, it, if it is captured by a local, we would hope that those also who sign on are committing to the requirement that you're training your people to provide factual information. And those companies would then audit to provide assurances that those things are actually happening. So we're going to rely on our volunteer, uh, you know, partners, our voluntary partners, to comply, and they have to create their own assurances. And if there is a way that we can find out that there's misinformation, then we're certainly going to do that. And I know that Patty and her team already do that so as a service to the to the community and 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 ensuring again that we're providing. Um, the best experiences, the most accurate experiences here. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. I hope we have a successful season. Maybe we can afford some heat next year. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for your time. 
That concludes the presentation. We're gonna move on to mayor and council comments. I'm also gonna ask uh, if either the acting city manager or acting courts director, if you guys have any comments, um, feel free. So we'll actually start with you, Lacey. Your Honor, I don't have any specific comments. This was really helpful information, I think, for, for the council and for the community. Um, for ongoing discussions of a tourism manager. So it's been helpful for me and I look forward to hearing what the council has to say and how we can continue to refine the process of discussing a tourism manager. Thank you, Mr. Helson. Um, I, I would second what uh, Lacey said. I would also add that I think the presentations, if we could get copies of those, I think it would uh, really facilitate uh, Daryl Verfi's transition as the new Port and Harbor's director. Uh, so that was very helpful. I think it'll be very helpful. Thank you. Okay. I'm glad this presentation happened so that this body knows what the KVB does and what the plans are for the future. I'm very excited that this coming season we will have a grip of what is going on and we will also have giving the guest a great experience, and I'm hoping through the tourism best management practices, we will make sure our local citizens are taken care of, their complaints are mitigated, and things are set right. So I'm glad this presentation happened. Thank you, Abby. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, thank you to all the presenters. Um, always great information. It's always great to share with other non-industry folks what, what we do every day. Um, I guess when I brought forth the tourism director position, I, in hindsight, I wish I would have gone about it a little different and brought forth my own description versus Juno's description. So I think that did mislead the community, as uh, Patty Mackey had said, um, on truly what we need as a council, a community, um, and just our staff. Currently, in my eyes, there are many different people wearing a hat to help support some aspect of the city operations side of tourism. So you have the city manager doing something, you have the assistant manager, you have the port director, the harbor master. They're all working on fee structures and talking with cruise lines to work on improvements. All these back-end stuff that not necessarily you see on that side. Um, and it, it takes a lot of time for instance, this bus situation. You know, we couldn't hand that off. You know, we used our partners, thank you to uh, Claw and Hat for working on that, but it also took a city person to represent the community and the citizens to figure out what was the best solution, not only for Ward Cove, but what was the best solution for our community in general. And that's one thing that I know I've said at previous meetings, Everyone here listed who they represented, and none of them were actual citizens. They're paid members, cruise lines, um, all these various people. And so that's what I think our citizens lack, especially the non-industry um, folks, which we, we know there's a large part of, part of the population that doesn't have anything to do with directly with the industry. And I think it's important that we have somebody that listens to both sides and does what Mark just did on the Ward Cove bus solution and find that happy medium. And the it's hard to say, okay, you know, you guys work for your members and everything and create a plan for the city. It's hard to ask that of an organization that does represent, you know, a private sector or a group of people, not necessarily the whole community, even though we hope that everybody would move towards the best goal for the community, not just their private industry. And I think so bringing forth this tourism director, um, it wasn't necessarily to take over positions of the KVB. I mean, they would not be marketing to independent travelers in my mind. They would be focused on the operations side um, and upland improvements and um, kind of taking that weight off of our city management that already has a multi-million dollar utility company to manage and a city to manage as well as a port. And as we move into a new city manager, that person, we're not gonna find anyone like Carl that can manage all three entities 
and make it all work. So he's going to need key people that understand the industry, that represent the citizens' best interests to bring forth those ideas and those um, whatever fee structures, because I'm really set on these fee structures right now, but bring those forward to the city manager and then to the council to help create and establish a uniform for our community. Um, and so, of course, they'd be standing, I would hope they would be standing next to Patty at Sea Trade, you know, uh, supporting her and her marketing efforts to the cruise lines and to independent travelers. I hope they'd stand by, you know, side by side. Same with um, Rick, you know, helping whatever we can do with scheduling and so forth. So I just think having, my intention was to have somebody that represented us at the table and our citizens because we just don't represent the industry and we need the industry and we need to work together, but we need somebody sitting at this table with wonderful leaders that is that city person that's not the city manager because they have so much to do. So that was my whole intention of bringing forth this specific position. Um, there's a lot of stuff that city manager does behind scenes that they, the new person that isn't going to be able to do and we have to realize that. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Well, that... I'm not particularly convinced that we need a tourism manager myself, um, uh, just cost-wise at this point. Um, but maybe in the future, uh, when finances get better, uh, after this year, this is going to be it. <laughs> um, I am. So excited about the TBMP. <laughs> um, uh, I think that's going to be the best thing to happen to to the tourism industry in a long time. I think I think it could be very effective. So I'm excited. Thank you for bringing that forward. Thank you, really. I appreciate everybody coming and giving the presentations. I found it very. Uh, very helpful and informative in understanding what you guys do. Um, I think on this issue with the tourism manager position, possibly, we got to be real careful with it. Um, just from Mr. Erickson's presentation, you know, I could see that if we get somebody on board that maybe has a little different outlook, potentially it could cause a lot of problems. So I think we got to kind of put faith in the experts who've been working in this industry uh, in their various ways for many years successfully. Uh, also, I wanted to emphasize again, as I've said before, that as much as we are all have valid concerns and things that we are, uh, yeah, concerns about the tourism industry, I always want to point out that prior to the pandemic that was kind of out of Ketchikan's hands, I think the tourism industry has been very successful over the years. All our different partners and people, players in the game are, uh, play a role in that. But I think as hopefully the ships begin to return, we got to kind of let it play out and get back to where we were. So I'm hopeful that happens sooner than later. And echoing what Lalette said on the cost of hiring a new employee at, I forget what it was, 120 something or 30 something thousand with benefits. You know, sometimes more government isn't always good, even though the idea, you know, the the intent might be good, but you know, once you get somebody in that position, it could it could potentially be not so good. So that's all I've got. Thank you guys for your presentations. Thank you, Judy. Thank you all for your presentations. Um, I do have a lot of thoughts on this whole subject, but um, I want to take the opportunity to review the presentations again. I took quite a few notes, um, and I want to make sure that we look at this carefully and thoughtfully. Um, yes, money is a factor, um, but I don't think that it's necessarily, you know, the breaking factor. I think we need to look at what's good for the whole community. It was never, I don't think, the intent to, um, you know, take over KVB. You are an organization that works for your members. Um, and so that never even crossed my mind anyway. Uh, but I think there is a, a place for someone in tourism, certainly not um, doing scheduling, but I think it's important that 
they understand that so that they can tell the rest of the community why it's done the way it's done. I mean, just as a council person, uh, we get so many calls. Um, and so I think that, you know, just having somebody that's our face would be good. What that job looks like, I'm not prepared to, you know, say anything on that until I look at, there was a lot of information presented tonight and I appreciate all of it. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jenny. Yeah, I really appreciate the um, everybody coming out tonight and freezing our butts off in this building. <laughs> but um, the I think um, it was great information, and I agree with um, what Judy said. There's, I think it's nice to have, um, considering the amount of things we're always working on and the amount of time that has to go into something like this, having somebody that's designated to be our... Um, boots on the ground, per se, so that we have somebody that's actually um, participating in it. This is a full-time job. And uh, um, all of us at this table, um, this is not our full-time job. Although I do feel like sometimes it is, most of the time. Sorry. Um, <laughs> the, um, I think just listening to this presentation and the past several weeks and several years, um, one of my... I think just to drop a idea in the bucket is that we tend to spend a lot of time um, discussing everything on the inside of downtown Ketchikan in the middle as uh, it past the tunnel. And we like to just uh, put everybody right in the center. And I think it's important and something that's been brought to my attention by many uh, several of the businesses down on the uh, Newtown area is that when are we going to be um, thought of? So, you know, there's been a lot of rejuvenation in the, uh, just past the tunnel before you, you know, in the Newtown area and um, several new businesses that would really like uh, some thought put into um, how uh, they would be addressed and marketed. Um, a lot of times I had a couple people tell me that no one gets off the boardwalk. Um, we, I know that we, before pandemic, we had talked about uh, putting in the uh, flaggers down there at the um, old bypass. Um, I still think that's an important um, discussion due to the fact that it's extremely dangerous in that spot with the buses turning into berth four. Um, there's some blind spots with the crosswalk. Um, I've actually watched people crossing and there's a bus right there. And I know there's people coming, so I stop. And I had a guy lay on his horn because he wanted me to move. Now, if I had moved, who's to say he wouldn't hit those people in the crosswalk? So it's, I think, um, I know maybe I'm off topic, maybe I'm not, but... Um, Newtown seems to get lost in the shuffle when it comes to some of these conversations, and I think it would be nice that um, we consider all of our uh, players, including the ones on the other side of the tunnel and not just in the downtown core and on berth one and two. Thank you. I want to thank everybody who came tonight and presented. It was a lot of really, really good information. Um, it's quite an education to see what all of you folks in the industry do to pull off a season. Um, Ketchikan has a, has a long and storied cruise ship tourism history in a town not made for cruise ship tourism. And one of the things that I've said over these last couple of years going back to the RFP None of these concerns or discussions were ever, at least in my perspective, based upon the cruise ships aren't scheduled well or the KVB is not doing a good job. It wasn't a lack of anything. I think the industry, every facet that you folks deal with is, is well managed. That being said, two takeaways from the RFP for me was we can no longer afford the status quo, and we can do it ourselves. 
one of the obligations we have as city council people is we don't have, I don't want to say the luxury, we have a, a larger lens. How does tourism affect the community at large, the greater community? The status quo isn't maintainable. I've just finished my sixth and final budget cycle. And I don't mean this just with tourism, but by and large, what we've been doing as a community is not sustainable. Simply growing bigger and doing the same thing into the future isn't the solution. I think tonight's presentation was really valuable in helping to start to identify the areas with which a tourism manager might be able to be of benefit to the community. That was one of the comments I got from people all throughout the RFP. We don't need an outside entity. We can do it ourselves. Well, that's what the tourism manager idea is. The community doing it themselves. The 8,000 people who actually own the Port of Ketchikan, having that person so that people can go to that person with their problems, their concerns, their ideas, and they all have an equal voice. Um, this, is a, this is a first step. We'll see if it comes to fruition or not. Money is always a concern. How do we budget for another $150,000 position? Well, Mr. Gass, I won't have that any input into that. I'll leave that up to you. Um, I'll be gone. But um, again, I just want to really thank um, you folks for coming out tonight. This was a really good presentation, and I'm, I'm really grateful. And with that, if there is no more comments or questions, we will entertain a motion to Move adjourn. Move to adjourn, please. Second. Thank you.